to our competitor. It appears the live stream is up and we are recording. So we will get started with the final round. Congratulations to all the competitors who have made it to the final round. Okay, um, so welcome to the 2022 Herbert Wexler National Criminal Moot Court Competition, the final round. My name is Kenny Omarosco. I am the president of Buffalo Moot Court Board and I will be timekeeping for this round. This year's competitors will be arguing the case of Chase v. United States. On behalf of the Buffalo Moot Court Board, I would like to thank the judges for volunteering their time and for making this competition possible. Shortly, we will begin the round with arguments from the petitioner and conclude with arguments from the respondent. The petitioners are team 23, Savannah Valentine and Evan Gilbert. And the respondent is team 30, Danielle Musselman and Hannah Merrill. The judges for this round are Judge Eugene Fahey, Judge Leslie Fascio, and Dean Aviva Abramovsky. Judges are encouraged to offer comments and suggestions to the competitors at the conclusion of the round. However, scores will not be offered to competitors at that time. Judges should be aware that the team numbers are random. They do not reflect rank in any manner. We will now begin the round. Oye, oye, the United States Supreme Court is now in session. Presiding are the Honorable Chief Justice Fascio, Justice Fahey, and Justice Abramovsky, hearing the case of Chase United States. Welcome, uh, competitors, to the uh, uh, session of the uh, of the court. Apparently, we finally uh, issued a certiorari for this issue, and we're glad to have you resolve it. Uh, would you just introduce yourself, please, before you uh, begin your presentation? Uh, for the petitioner, who, uh, who is speaking? Yes, Mr. Chief Justice Evan Gilbert. Evan, um, I'll, Gilbert. I'll be doing issue one. Mr. Gilbert, um, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Good afternoon, and may it please the court. Evan Gilbert, on behalf of the petitioner, Mr. Joe Mar Chase, along with co-counsel Savannah Valentine, we'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal, one minute from each of our times. Uh, as long as our bailiff is able to keep score on that, it's fine with me. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I'll be addressing why Crawford versus Washington applies in this case, not Maryland versus Craig, and co-counsel will address why there would be a confrontation clause violation, no matter which test the court applies here. Your Honor, the lower court committed a fundamental error in applying Craig rather than Crawford. This error led to the violation of Joe Mar Chase's unassailable Sixth Amendment right to confrontation. Because of these errors, this court should reverse the 13th Circuit for two reasons. First, this court has the opportunity to reaffirm Crawford in upholding that the fundamental procedural right of the Confrontation Clause protects in-person, face-to-face confrontation. And second, Craig should be overruled because allowing vague public policy considerations to invade the Sixth Amendment's protections leaves defendants' constitutional rights vulnerable to the whims of individual judges and prosecutors and creates the possibility for endless exceptions to defendants' Sixth Amendment confrontation rights. I'm not quite sure how we, how we can do that, Mr. Gilbert, since the uh, issue before us is not the issue before the, before the court in uh, in. Uh, Your Honor, uh, the issue here is fundamentally the same, and it's about whether the defendant can cross-examine the witnesses against him. And in Crawford, this court revolutionized its confrontation clause jurisprudence, rejected an open-ended balancing approach established in Ohio versus Roberts in 1980 and relied on in Craig in favor of a categorical requirement but, for in-person Excuse me, Mr. Gilbert, I, as I recall it, what we had to resolve in Gilbert was whether or not the out-of-court statement was admissible uh, in violation of the uh, Confrontation Clause, not whether or not the Confrontation Clause required a face-to-face, in-person confrontation, which is the issue here. 
Your Honor, the facts were different in the cases, but the procedural rights that the Confrontation Clause guarantees were at issue in both cases. And this court in Crawford went in a completely different direction than the Craig court in saying that the Sixth Amendment can't be subject to balancing tests. The, the right so, to confrontation. So let me, let me ask you this. Uh, um, uh, why wasn't Craig overruled in Crawford then? It, it seems that Justice Scalia doesn't miss much. Why wouldn't he have overruled that here? Your Honor, we, we can't get into the mind of, of Justice Scalia now, but uh, this court today has the opportunity to overrule Craig. It's possible that because the facts were so different well, in Crawford. Sure, but you, you, un, you understand my point. Um, uh, it, if it's such an absolute rule, wouldn't the court have specifically said that uh, we're overruling Craig? Not, not necessarily, Your Honor. Uh, well, because why, the court... why wouldn't they? Tell, tell me why not. What reason would you say why they didn't? Because here the court today is faced with a case that combines the two factual scenarios uh, of Craig and Crawford and puts mm -hmm. the heart of the confrontation clause at issue, which is the form that that cross-examination can take and what kind of test to apply to, to see whether uh, cross-examination is sufficient or not. Um, so while the, the facts of the cases were different, uh, the, the key confrontation right is, is the same in both cases, the key confrontation right at issue and it's cross-examination. And in Craig, the court held that uh, in a, the second part of, of the, the Craig test, the first part is the case specific necessity that furthers an important public policy interest. The second is ensuring the reliability of the testimony. In Craig, that's a balancing approach. It's balanced between four factors, oath, uh, the ability of the jury to see the witness and see the witness's demeanor. And then lastly, cross-examination. Crawford's holding is fundamentally at odds. I'm sorry, Your Honor. No, you go ahead. Go Robert's ahead. holding is, is fundamentally at odds with that in, in holding that the Sixth Amendment can't be subject to balancing tests like that. The cross, right, the cross examination right can't be balanced away. Um, and so the key is to say that cross examination has to happen either in court or there has to have been a prior uh, opportunity for cross examination. It's a categorical rule. The, this the the Sixth Amendment conversation, except right. for children, sexual abuse uh, charges are involved, perhaps. Well, Your Honor, uh, every rule there's an exception. Isn't that how we are taught as lawyers, Mr. Gilbert? Yes, Your Honor, and there are two potential exceptions to the Confrontation Clause that this court acknowledged in Crawford versus Washington: it's dying declarations and forfeiture by wrongdoing, and the only other way. To, to get around, so to speak, the confrontation clause is if a uh, witness is unavailable and there's been opportunity for cross-examination. In Craig, this court uh, said that, basically said that there would be, that there could be endless uh, examples of uh, some, some scenario meeting its public so, policy standards. So I have a, a question for you. Why is two, this first principle, why is two-way video conferencing not live confrontation? Because it's not in-person, physical, face-to-face -face confrontation. And because so it, we're holding, I mean, so we're holding this appellate hearing via Zoom right now. Um, would you say that there is a distinction in that for our capacity to make a judgment because of its method? Yes, Your Honor. Um, because of the, the role of the jury in the, in the trial process, um, and because the Constitution affords that Sixth Amendment right, there's there's no Sixth Amendment right for us to be holding this this argument these oral arguments on Zoom or in person. But there is that Sixth Amendment right uh, for a defendant to confront the witnesses against him. And, and to go back to the exception but, point, yeah, if you could if you could just though try to articulate to, to us though, what is distinct in kind from being live versus having this two way conversation. What is different? Well, there's differences in how the jury uh, can assess a witness. It's if uh, let's take Agent Travis, for example, there's no way for the jury to know, especially on this record, whether she was texting a prosecutor for help or 
what was in the room around her? Was there anyone else in the room around her? And just looking at those uh, factors shows why a balancing test is not appropriate for these types so of scenarios. Those seem like safeguards though that could be enacted uh, procedurally. It doesn't go to the heart of the matter as to why something live or via two-way conferencing is different fundamentally in kind. It, it matters, Your Honor, because under Craig, that's uh, one factor that uh, lower courts would take into consideration of whether uh, a specific live two-way video testimony met uh, the four factors in Craig. And, and that could lead to disparate uh, decisions. Well, just to follow up on that point then, Counselor, um, Justice Breyer had, had drawn the distinction, I think, early on between uh, um, basically asking the question, well, <clears throat> if this isn't gonna be allowed, can we now say that you can't submit a deposition um, and mark that in and have that testimony be brought in? Would, would we be precluded from uh, using a deposition in a trial setting under this theory? No, Your Honor. Um, well, the... that's the problem, see, because it, a deposition, of course, loses all nuance. It's a flat piece of paper. It's, it's black and white. Um, and that's one of the criticisms, of course, of, of this type of two-way video questioning. I, I'm struggling with that distinction. Your Honor, it's because under Rule 15, a uh, deposition like this would have to, in a criminal case, would have to be done under extraordinary circumstances. And those circumstances wouldn't have been met here. Um, Agent Travis wasn't truly unavailable. And um, so, there's, there's that, that standard I thought you, would not I have been that you're met. advocating for an absolute rule, an, an absolute confrontation clause rule that would never allow anything but uh, um, face to face confrontation. No, Your Honor. Uh, petitioner is advocating for a rule that allows video testimony only if uh, it, the witness is unavailable or su mm -hmm. and subject to cross examination. Well, and that's the law now, of course. But, um, <clears throat> The problem is, of course, I, I guess I don't see how we distinguish Craig and Crawford under your rule, because Craig seems to me, it, it could be seen as a how case, how, how, how to deal with this particular problem. And of course, Crawford is a case that says, when does this right come into play? And, and that seems to be the core, the analytical core of the distinction between the two. And, and you would be throwing out the how uh, and, and basically saying there's no when, there's a, it's always available. No, Your Honor. Um, Craig addresses the how, but in addressing the how, it sacrifices a de defendant's Sixth Amendment rights. Crawford can be applied to the how. So if you apply mm -hmm. Crawford to a case like Craig, for example, mm -hmm. it's possible that the child uh, sexual abuse victim there could have been unavailable because there, was, there would have been a permanent psychological trauma that would have existed from testifying in court in front of that child's abuser. Same, same here, it would be a different story if Agent Travis were permanently unavailable due to, due to an illness. Agent but, Travis was not permanently but, unavailable. But, but, but I was gonna ask a question, but I, now I'm inclined to build on what Judge Fahey just articulated. Uh, uh, I was going to ask, uh, how does a Zoom connection actually interfere with the fundamental uh, 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 value of uh, confrontation, which is cross-examination? That, that was going to be my one question. Um, and I guess on this uh, other issue that we're, we're, we're focusing on a little bit is uh, under Crawford, uh, the uh, the ration, the ration, the the concept of uh, a, chi a child a, a witness being permanently uh, prevented by tra alleged trauma is is really not contemplated because the child is available, as Justice uh, Scalia pointed out. Your Honor, it, on your, I mean, there's no distinction in his analysis with, between psychological impairment and physical unavailability. I guess I've got two questions out there for you. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, more cur I'm more curious about my first question, which is the how, in fact, uh, does uh, the use of Zoom, which is the issue in this case, uh, impair the uh, the effectiveness of the uh, cross examination? 
Yes, Your Honor. As you can see uh, in the record on pages five and six, um, there were times in Agent Travis's testimony where the audio gave out, where her face was on the lower portion of the screen. Um, so the, the jury would, couldn't see. You think that would really uh, impair the ability of the jury to make a, a, a sound evaluation of credibility? It may, Your Honor, but it's also more than just the specific technicalities. It's about that the, the defendant has that constitutional right to the physical in person. And so applying the two different tests, Craig versus Crawford, you come to completely different scenarios. Uh, so, in Craig, you have to balance. But we're, we're, it's, a, it's a bit of a circular argument that because the issue is why is two ways not sufficient confrontation? That is the issue, not on a question of the technical impediments, why, what is specifically different in kind about two-way live video confrontation than being live. Yes, Your Honor. It, the, the jury can't see the witness in full, doesn't know what's going on around the witness, doesn't know if the witness is being coached, can't evaluate, uh, just as we can't evaluate here, what's the, everything context-related besides seeing a person face-to-face. -face. And, and really, it's because the Constitution requires it, and that's what this court uh, held in, in announcing uh, its standard in Crawford, that before in, in Roberts, this court had uh, subjected the Sixth Amendment, Sixth Amendment confrontation right to balancing, but, but can no you more. Articulate, has... Can you articulate any exceptions that would satisfy your objections? Sorry. You have... your, your Honor, I see my time has expired. May I answer your question and briefly yes. conclude? Thank you. The, the exceptions uh, besides something not implicating the confrontation clause, which is the unavailability and cross-examination, the two potential exceptions which this court has discussed in cases since Crawford are dying declarations and forfeiture by wrongdoing. And for those reasons, your honors, we respectfully request that this court reverse the 13th circuit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gilbert. Uh, Ms. Valentine, you're front and center. Welcome. Where are you? There sure, she is. I'm here. <laughs> May I proceed? Yes, you may. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Savannah Valentine, and I, alongside Evan Gilbert, represent the petitioner, Joe Mar Chase. I will be arguing that this court should reverse the 13th Circuit's judgment because whether this court decides that Crawford or Craig applies, allowing unnecessary video testimony does violate uh, the, cons the constitutional right to confront for a defendant. This is a case about not allowing a defendant's right to confront the witnesses against him be sacrificed for the mere convenience of video testimony. First, if Crawford does apply, then Agent Travis was not unavailable to testify in person and her testimony was not subject to sufficient cross-examination. And second, if Craig applies, a witness that presents with no symptoms of COVID-19 and will be more than likely able to testify in just a couple of weeks in person presents an insufficient public policy interest to allow video testimony instead of in-person testimony. But that'll get in the way of the uh, court's obligation to assure the uh, accused of a speedy trial, would it not? No, Your Honor. Um, there are several cases where um, the courts have issued continuances for months at a time without it being a speedy trial issue. For example, um, in Peterson versus U.S. and U.S. versus Carter, the witnesses in those cases were pregnant and couldn't travel for a few more months until um, to testify in person. And the courts in those cases found that a continuance was appropriate instead of video because the courts there said they were not dead, beyond reach, or permanently incapacitated. And so, Your Honor, under Craig, a witness is not unavailable unless um, they, they do find themselves in a situation that is permanent or permanent illness. For example, in US versus Gigante, the court there found that the witness was unavailable because he had an inoperable fatal uh, cancer and had to be under constant medical supervision. And that was not going to go away in just a couple of weeks. And here on the record on page four and five, it they shows- could, uh, They could take, uh, they could take uh, video equipment into the uh into the hospital. 
Yes, Your Honor. And in U.S. versus Gigante, that was the appropriate remedy, the video testimony. But again, that's very um, not like the situation here, because in that case, it was a permanent ailment. Uh, the, the, the witness there was not going to recover. Uh, but here on the record on page four and so five. Let me, let me ask this question. Um, <clears throat> does the type of public health crisis you have uh, affect your analysis? For instance, this is a COVID-19 public health crisis, and people think at some point this is going to go away, but let's say it was something worse, the, the Black Plague, uh, and uh, or something similar to that, highly contagious and deliberately fatal. Would your analysis be the same? Mm -hmm. Your Honor, uh, it would be the same, because in this case... So I, I got the answer right then. The Black Plague's out. We're all dying every time we go down to the store. But you're saying that the court employees, the jurors, and everyone have to come in and we can't take testimony by video that's two-way? Your Honor, if, if the Black Plague was um, something that we found we could mitigate or get around somehow, for example, like we do with COVID-19, we social distance we mask wear, um, there's a vaccine available. I know there was not for the Black Plague, but if that were the same circumstance, then it well, would- Well, they didn't have two-way video on the Black Plague either, but but let's assume at the next plague, they do have two-way video, so you can try that. So if, if it is available, then wouldn't that be, um, uh, wouldn't, we, wouldn't it almost be absurd for us to constitutionally say that uh, we can't go forward to process and we had to release every, one who's charged with every crime because we couldn't um, have a uh, uh, um, take testimony in any other way but live. Well, Your Honor, um, a similar case to this one under Craig analysis is state versus Tate. And in that case, the court reiterated that it needs to be it, it needs to be more than a general concern for COVID-19. And, and that's the same if it were the black play. play. I think that's I think that's fair. But um, uh, uh, listen, my only experience as a judge is whatever you bad you think can't happen eventually does happen. And I think that uh, constitutionally, we should try and think in those terms in our analysis of them. That's why I asked the question. So assume it is true, it is happening, and there is some form of a public health crisis. Because if we're simply arguing about what type of public health crisis um, is sufficient to um, uh, alter the format by which we take testimony, that seems to me a, a reasonable question for the government to pursue. If it's simply that um, uh, the format itself is sufficient in protecting the rights of the defendant, then that's a little different. So you see what I'm saying? I, I do understand your okay. point, Your Honor. Uh, again, though, here, um, it, it's it's more, we, we have more, or the, you need more than a generalized public health concern. It, it can't just be you're scared of the Black Plague and don't want to leave your house. You're scared of COVID-19, don't want to leave your house. Um, you, you do need a, a particularized health concern. Um, and here, Agent Travis would have more than likely recovered, been completely healthy, and been able to travel to testify in person. Um, during COVID-19, courts have found that a witness is not able to travel travel in person or travel to testify in person when they are dealing with circumstances that cannot be mitigated. So for example, in US versus Akavan and in US versus Donziger, both of the courts found that the witnesses could testify through video because of their ages and permanent health conditions that made them particularly susceptible to COVID-19. However, here, even though Agent Travis is unvaccinated and she actually had COVID-19, it was more than likely um, that she would recover fully and been able to travel to testify in person. According to the CDC, during the time of the trial in May of 2021, 158 out of 100,000 people who were unvaccinated were hospitalized, which just goes to show that the likelihood of hospitalization or death, even for someone who's unvaccinated, is extremely unlikely. And at the time of the trial, or at the time she was tested, Agent Travis had not even begun to show symptoms. She was completely asymptomatic, and that's on the record on pages five and six. And so it was substantially unlikely that she would have fallen ill permanently. And so in this case, a continuance would have been the more appropriate route. 
Um, in California versus Green, this court held that temporary circumstances do not make a witness truly unavailable. And again, going back to the cases in Peterson uh, versus U.S. and U.S. versus Carter, where the witnesses were pregnant, a distinguishing um, factor in those cases was that the, the, their conditions would end and they knew that they would end and be able to travel to testify in person. Um, here, oh, I, we also- I, have, I, I still have a question. I mean, is 2A video conferencing really, isn't it really functionally equivalent? I'm still asking for that articulation. The, the witness can, can evaluate demeanor. There's a full opportunity for cross-examination. It's preserved. I, I'm, I'm still not hearing exactly what is different from having the ability, just like now, to confront live, right? Um, and, and why would it be different from an appellate hearing to a trial? Your Honor, um, in a video testimony, it's not the same as in-person testimony under Crawford. Uh, in Crawford, this court explicitly mentioned face-to-face -face confrontation three times and relied heavily on Maddox for which is United States in doing so. And in that case, the court said um, the, the purpose behind the Sixth Amendment is to give the defendant an opportunity to cross-examine the witness uh, in a way that gives him the ability to expose lies and inconsistencies from the witness and allows the jury to observe that witness's demeanor. Um, however, uh, over Zoom or a video testimony, even if it's live to a video testimony like here, uh, the jury's ability to see the witness's demeanor and judge the credibility from that demeanor is severely hindered, especially when there are technical difficulties, even if those technical difficulties are minor, as the 13th Circuit says they were here. There is research suggesting that jury's perception of witnesses when the witnesses are through video, even live to a video, um, are subconsciously impacted. Uh, there's something well, called- I couldn't hear what you said, please, Ms. Valentine, or how, imp how are they impacted? I'm sorry. Subconsciously impacted, Your subconsciously. Honor. Subconsciously. Uh, there, there's, there's research that is able to test subconsciously. <laughs> yes, uh, it, it compares their judgment on them from when they're in person interacting with the witness versus- Is that in the record? <laughs> No, Your Honor, it's not in the record. Um, but but there is a, um, a something called displaced aggression in psychology, uh, which is- What was that again, please? Some kind of aggression? Displaced aggression. Displaced. Uh, and that's, that's a thing that happens when um, there are technological difficulties over video or with some other technology, and the jurors get frustrated with the technology but take it out on the, the presenting attorney or um, the defendant. And that can result in overly harsh or unfair sentencing. And in fact, in 1999, Cook County, Illinois began to allow bail hearings um, over video. And they found uh, when an, uh, analyzing the outcomes that there were a, there was a significant increase in the penalties when they started the video hearings. Hmm. Sorry, additionally, um, the testimony through video lacks the intimidation and the seriousness of trial because it's less formal. And this court in Lee versus Illinois stressed the importance of face-to-face -face confrontation and said that the symbolic purpose consists of promoting an open and even contest in a public trial. And because of the psychological effects that happen when a jury is looking at a, at a witness through video, the symbolic purpose of an open and even contest is dramatically reduced. Additionally- oh, I, I circle back and I apologize if this is treading on the wrong uh, division of labor here, but uh, does that mean that um, in these uh, child uh, sexual abuse cases that effectively either the child testifies in court, in person, face-to-face -face with the accused or the case goes away? So that's, that's essentially it, right? According to your what you've just said. No, Your Honor. Under a Craig analysis, um, uh, the court there said that the, the video testimony in that case was appropriate because it was permanent psychological trauma that that child would have suffered if she were to be in the same room as her, uh, as the person she was accusing. 
uh, here we're not talking about permanent trauma or a, a child victim or a victim at all. We're talking about a, an agent Travis who was a witness. That, that's an opinion of, of a psychologist, right? I mean, no one really knows for sure whether that would in fact be the outcome. No, you're, you're right, Your Honor. Uh, no one knows for sure if the child would have suffered permanent trauma. Um, but this court in Craig found that that was that was the likely the case and went off of that when deciding whether video test. Yes, but if video in but if in person is required under the uh, if we construe the confrontate word confront to require in in person, then as a practical matter, uh, uh, any any child that's uh, uncomfortable with testimony means that the accused uh, the case against the accused goes away. And all of those uh, statute, state statutes that permit such procedures are unconstitutional on their face, correct? Your Honor, if it's an, if the Constitution requires in-person testimony, it requires it under Crawford when the, when the witness is um, available to testify in person and subject to sufficient cross-examination. Uh, which was not the case here. But under Craig, this court has recognized that permanent psychological trauma or permanent trauma in general. So, so just last question. I mean, isn't part of the reasoning in Craig actually that the child witness's testimony would be more reliable as a result of the method of using video, not simply for harm for, the, for themselves, but also in that the nature allows better testimony? And if so, why wouldn't there be the potential for such benefits in other cases? Your Honor, the, the court in Craig found that it would have been more reliable, uh, possibly because the child had suffered at the hands of the defendant directly, and it was a child who may have gotten nervous in front of the defendant or something uh, similar to that. That's not the case here. Agent Travis is a, a, an adult. She was not scared of the defendant, and I'm sorry, I see my time is up. May I briefly conclude? Yes. As she was not scared of the defendant and would have that that concern is not not a concern in this case. So for the foregoing reasons, we respectfully request that this court reverse the 13th Circuit's judgment, denying petitioner's objection to the video testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Valentine. Uh, for the respondent, we have Ms. Uh, Danielle Musselman. Is that correct? That is First correct. Speaker. And second uh, presenter is uh, Ms. Hannah Merrill. Welcome to the uh, welcome to the court, um, Ms. Musselman. You're the first uh, up. Thank you, Honorable Chief Justice, Associate Justices, and may it please the court. My name is Danielle Musselman, and I, along with Hannah Merrill, represent the respondent in this case, the United States of America, as Team Thirty. I will be addressing the first issue before the court regarding the continued applicability of Maryland versus Craig to remote testimony cases while well, my co-counsel will address the second issue regarding the application of the test to the facts in this case. Your honors, respondents ask that this court affirm the decision of the lower court and apply Craig for the following two reasons. First, that Craig remains good law as it is in line with the historical purposes of the confrontation clause and has not been supplanted. And second, that the principles of constitutional stare decisis justify upholding Craig as it is both workable and justified. Turning to my first point, your honors, which is that Craig is good law as it is in line with the historical purposes of the confrontation clause and has not been supplanted by Crawford versus Washington because as the associate justices noted, Crawford said when confrontation is required and Craig says how. Looking so so let, let me ask you a question since I was the how and the why judge. Um, uh, how uh, how does Craig survive Roberts being overruled in Crawford? What's left? Really? Your Honor, in Craig, Craig cited to Roberts to the extent to say that the confrontation clause was written to require reliability of testimony. Craig then went on to define reliability as requiring the oath, cross-examination, and valid technology. On these points, Craig and Crawford are not in conflict. Crawford also said that the touchstone of confrontation is cross-examination. Both Craig and Crawford require cross-examination and they require the oath. But Craig was tailored specifically to address the issue of remote testimony. It is the better fit for cases such as this because it was tailored 
for cases such as well, this. Let's talk about that a little bit because here we're basically talking about it. as a trial judge, I would have said, you just get a continuance and, and uh, or, or you just bring them in afterwards. It seems to be relatively straightforward. So do we want to establish a rule that has one type of testimony for a particular crime and another type of testimony that's allowable for other crimes? Isn't the presumption of innocence a requirement that, that basically everyone has to prove the testimony through the same set of rules? And aren't you um, possibly undermining it by not doing that? No, Your Honor, the application of Craig would be to all cases, that all cases that are brought before the courts are subjected to the Craig test when remote testimony is at issue. And so, the, so you're saying Craig then it does it, it there's, there's not just a narrow survival of Craig, you're saying Craig is surviving in full bloom after yes. Crawford. Oh, yes. All right, well, why don't you expand on that? Your Honor, Craig does apply and continue to exist broadly to cases such as this, which do not have child abuse victims. Rather, the issue is remote testimony. The Craig test was written with the acknowledgement that it would apply to other factual scenarios and that this court did not narrowly define public policy, the second prong, the public policy prong, to only apply when there are child victims of sex abuse. Rather, this court left that open for courts to determine in later cases when there is a valid public policy interest. And your honors, Craig and Crawford still do live in harmony because they touch distinct issues of confrontation. Crawford deals with pretrial matters and hearsay that will never happen during the trial proceeding. Craig mandates what happens during the trial proceeding, how so, confrontation- so you, so you agree with what I said before, which is Craig is the, is the how and Crawford is the when. Yes, your what honor. Is a larger issue, which is that by drawing that distinction, we're providing, um, we're undermining the presumption of innocence um, in, in, by, by changing the procedures for the type of crime where it applies. Do you understand my concern? So different crime, different procedures. If I'm, if I'm accusing you of a, a sexually related crime against a child, uh, and uh, the proof can come in one way. Um, but if I am accused of uh, financial malfeasance, the proof can come in another way. And we both could be charged with D felonies and have a particular um, exposure. Or why should one have the benefit of a particular type of proof and another not? And what, you know, why, aren't, why aren't all the defendants being treated the same way? Your Honor, first, respectfully, respondent's argument is that Craig would apply to all types of crime, merely that there must be a showing that, A, the testimony, remote testimony, is necessary by an important public policy interest, which is separate and apart from the crime charged, and then also that there are those indicia of reliability, meaning the oath, the cross-examination and valid technology. And that is the Craig standard that should be applied to remote testimony. And yes, so you, yes, you yes. Jack, Judge Scalia's uh, point that face-to-face uh, 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 -face is in essence the only way to do it and that the indicia of reliability um, softens that constitutional right completely. Your Honor, even under Justice Scalia's concerns and point about face-to-face -face being the primary and perhaps the preferred route, even if the court applies petitioner's argument of Crawford, Crawford would permit remote testimony in certain circumstances. But, the there's no such, uh, but there's no such thing, according to seven justices of this court in Crawford, as a preferred uh, methodology for uh, vindicating the confrontation clause, correct? And, and furthermore, the, 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 the uh, analytic basis in, in uh, Craig of reliability plus uh, uh, social policy or public policy is eradicated uh, by, our, uh, by Justice Scalia's uh, 
powerful uh, opinion in uh, in Crawford, is it not? Your Honor, no, Craig is not, in fact, eradicated by the decision in Crawford. Crawford and Craig, in fact, both place emphasis on the importance of cross-examination as the touchstone of the confrontation clause. Both require it, and they agree there. What Craig does, however, is mandate how confrontation may be satisfied. It was a test specifically tailored for that interest. And it all- Well, except, uh, except uh, the, the type of confrontation, according to Justice Scalia's careful uh, historical analysis, is face-to-face -face that's required, period, full stop. Correct? Your Honor, Justice Scalia did emphasize face-to-face -face confrontation. However, if we do look to those historical purposes articulated in Coy versus Iowa, which was also written by Justice Scalia, it is clear that there are two purposes, a truth-seeking and a symbolic purpose, and the Craig test meets both. The truth-seeking purpose- Well, except that uh, according to uh, Justice Scalia, uh, video representation, if you will, electronic of the image of the accused, the accuser is not the same functionally at the trial in the courtroom as cross-examination of the accuser in person. Is that not true? Your Honor, there are some differences, which is why respondents would contest that re remote testimony must still be subjected to a test and not utilized in every case. It is just are that- the are you, I, I, I was going to bring this up, but I just can't resist. So you bet. Are, are you familiar with the movie, uh, A Few Good Men? I have Tom watched Cruz it, and, Your Honor. Uh, Jack Nicholson. Yes. I've, I've watched parts. Yes, Your Honor. Do you remember the climactic scene when Cruz turns to Nicholson as he's trying to leave the witness stand and he goes after him in such a way as to cause the colonel to admit that he ordered red code, right? Yes, Your right? Honor. Yeah. Yes, Your Honor. Pretty dramatic, wouldn't you say? Yes, Your Honor, it was. Can I ask you this question? Do you think if that happened in real life using Zoom that the cross-examination would have been successful? Your Honor, it is likely that it would still have been successful. We are conducting this hearing on this court today, and I certainly feel the emphasis of your justice's questions and answer them in kind. And certainly the witness in that case could also do the same and cross-examination by a well-trained trial attorney would come off much the same way, even over remote testimony. Especially, especially if they had the script that uh, Tom Cruise had, right? <laughs> Yes, Your Honor, especially in that instance. And turning to my second point, which is that Craig should be retained based on the principles of constitutional stare decisis because it is both workable and justified. In Payne versus Tennessee, this court stated that when constitutional precedent is to be overturned, it must, done so, must be done so only when that precedent is unworkable and there is a strong justification in favor of overturning that precedent. Craig is both workable and in fact remains justified. First to its workability, at least six circuits and a state Supreme Court sitting on bonk have all had no trouble applying the Craig standard. The Supreme Court of Missouri sitting on bonk looked at all three standards, the Crawford standard, the Craig standard, and then a line of cases coming out of the second circuit stemming from United States versus Gaganti. And after looking at all three of those standards, the Supreme Court stated, Craig applies. Craig is the proper test for remote testimony. Similarly, in the Ninth Circuit in United States versus Carter, that court did not even address any possible dispute between Craig and Crawford and simply applied Craig to the facts at issue and moved through the test successfully. Your honors, the lower courts understand that Craig's test the reliability prong does not is not reliant on Robert. What they what they perhaps don't understand is Justice Scalia's point about the dynamics between the cross examiner and the witness in a courtroom with the accused person looking at the witness face to face. Is that not a fair comment? 
Your Honor, based upon the way these lower- Well, put it another way. If you were in the shoes of uh, the accused and Craig, would you prefer that your witness be examined through Zoom or in person in the courtroom? Your Honor, certainly I would prefer face-to-face -face confrontation. However, the realities are that certain instances may justify remote testimony. And when not according to the founders as they drafted the confrontation clause, unlike so many of the other amendments, wouldn't you say this one seems to say what it means and means what it says compared, for example, to the ambiguities inherent in the second amendment and other amendments? Your honors, even in the confrontation clause, this court has found limitations. In Crawford, this court said that non-testimonial hearsay is not subjected to confrontation and that even testimonial hearsay must simply have a prior opportunity. Well, for that's a tautology for sure. <laughs> Correct. Your we're Honor. Only, the founders were only concerned about testimony. <laughs> they, they were concerned about testimony, but even non-testimonial hearsay are, is still evidence admitted against a defendant. And this court has drawn lines in Crawford. It also established a different standard in Crawford that said the confrontation may be satisfied even if cross-examination happens outside of the purview of the jury. This court has drawn limitations even in Crawford itself. And the Craig Fair limitation enough. is a clear and proper standard as the lower courts have in fact been able to understand that Craig requires an oath, cross-examination, valid technology, and that the public policy interests must be carefully weighed based but upon- But you and I are both in agreement that it's not the same when it comes over Zoom versus in person, right? Correct, Your Honor. It is not the same, which is why- Well, then Craig... it's not the same. It's not within the four corners of the amendment, is it? Your Honor, it is not within the four corners, but even under Crawford or Craig, this court has permitted testimony that was not contemplated by the founders and therefore would satisfy confrontation. And Craig remains justified based upon the reality of health crises in our nation and the evolution of modern technology. It is for these reasons that we ask that this court continue to apply Maryland versus Craig and uphold the decision of the lower court. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Musselman. Well, uh, last but not least, Ms. Merrill, after that, are you, you sure you want to go forward? Yes, Chief Justice, may I proceed? <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. Honorable Chief Justice, Associate Justices, and may it please the court. My name is Hannah Merrill, and I too represent the respondent, the United States of America, for Team 30. We respectfully request that this court uphold the 13th Circuit's decision and find that Agent Travis's Zoom testimony was properly admitted at trial for two reasons. First, under the correct test of Craig, Agent Travis's virtual testimony was admissible because avoiding known COVID-19 exposure at court is a strong public policy interest and her testimony was sufficiently reliable. And second, even if this court extends Crawford to Agent Travis's testimony, the trial court correctly allowed her testimony because her COVID-19 diagnosis rendered her unavailable and she was subject to live cross-examination. That's not true, is it, counsel? <clears throat> she most certainly physically was available, correct? Your Honor, that brings me to my second point. She wasn't point, overseas. Was... She wasn't on her deathbed. <laughs> uh, she could have testified. Yes? Yes, Your Honor. And while there's no necessarily strict definition of Crawford or of unavailability under Crawford or other cases, courts have held witnesses unavailable when they fell ill. For example, in Roman v. Bergui, two but days she was, before- She was, well, was she so ill she couldn't physically come to the courtroom? Your Honor, according to the record on page five, she was currently asymptomatic. However, she was unvaccinated, which did present a risk of worsening her symptoms. <clears throat> you know, the only problem with that- oh, I'm sorry, go Judge, ahead. you go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, Judge. I was just gonna say, um, as a Buffalo Bills fan, it seemed to me like six or seven of our starting players were- uh, um, uh, unavailable and they played half the season. So it, 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 that's a tough argument to make, I think. Um, uh, I, I think Judge Fascio has hit on a, an important point that I struggle with here. 
Your Honor, importantly- Well, let me hit on it. Let me hit on it. So uh, again, Ms. Merrill, so you can dig, dig in here. Uh, uh, my understanding uh, of the, uh, the, the, the uh, medical science behind the COVID is that it's transmitted aerosol, it, not by touch. Uh, and interestingly, uh, for Justice Fahey, he knows, because I can tell, that that was actually the same uh, situation with the Black Plague. And the Black Plague is still with us, as we know. Um, and my understanding is that it, as long as there are glass panels that prevent the aerosol from carrying forward, and not even on side to side, uh, the likelihood of infection or transmission is pretty low, almost zero. So if the courtroom had been fitted out with the correct uh, remediation, is there any reason to believe that there was a serious risk of uh, infection to uh, other persons in the courtroom if Ms. Travis had been allowed or required to testify? Your Honor, importantly, this trial took place in the context of May 2021 in the Western District of Erie when the courthouse there had just recently opened up again. The court was utilizing strict health protocols in order to ensure that those that came into the courthouse were protected by the court and were not exposed to COVID-19. For example, the district court in United States v. Cole held that a witness was unavailable because she had to travel internationally, which would then expose individuals at the court to COVID-19. So, so I just have a question. Um, you know, who created those court guidelines? And are we trying to seed? I mean, is the argument being made that the, those who have the capacity to make the procedural um, guidelines for any specific court trumps a constitutional right? Or how would you weigh the two? Your Honor, it certainly would not automatically trump any constitutional right. The policy would have to be looked at in light of the health situation and the illness and pandemic that is currently in society. And in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and its particular risk for airborne travel, even with glass barriers, Agent Travis's positive diagnosis for the disease rendered her unavailable under Crawford. Unlike- but even at its worst, I'm still unclear why the court would have a continuance. In this case, the continuance would be particularly inappropriate due to the nature of COVID-19. As State v. Tate recognized out of the Minnesota Court of Appeals, continuances during the time of COVID-19 are particularly hard to gauge exactly when the continuance will come to an end. And as the Chief Justice pointed out to opposing counsel, that comes to butt up against the defendant's right to a speedy trial. Well, what's wrong with the long, excuse me, Ms. Ms. Merrill, what, what is wrong with a longer continuance, say 14 days? Your Honor, the problem with a continuance in this particular case is the risk that other individuals involved with the, with the trial would contract the virus, leading to a never ending series of continuances. I, I, like could, you, could you repeat that, please? The, the, video, the audio is a little weak here, unfortunately. Go ahead. Yes, of course. Uh, essentially, the worry in this particular case is the risk of a series of continuances that could occur due to a variety of people getting COVID-19 while the court was not in session. Well, we're only talking about one witness here, aren't we? Yes, Your Honor. However, if the court were to break for 14 days for a continuance, which is the required quarantine period, Courts have noted that continuances are particularly impracticable because of the risk that others involved in the trial could contract the disease. But and that, that really, was, let me let me stop you. That that really wasn't the practical problem. And you probably you know this better than I do. But it, I thought that uh, um, you're putting your case on. You don't have a witness, um, uh, and uh, uh, the defendant hasn't put his case on yet. Could, wouldn't you go forward, let the defendant put on his case, and then? bring this witness in as a rebuttal witness. It, it seems to me that a fair amount of what's being framed in constitutional terms is really uh, uh, the way the judges put it before, an argument over convenience and, and court rules, which are perfectly practical. There's nothing wrong with them, but they don't address fundamental constitutional concerns. And uh, and it seems to me they have to give way. Convenience does not outweigh the Sixth Amendment. 
Your Honor, certainly convenience is not an important public policy interest that would qualify under Craig. However, the COVID-19 pandemic is, and in this case, to your suggestion no, about- No, no, I, I, I let me stop you. I don't know if I agree with you that, that the pandemic does outweigh constitutional concerns. That's an ongoing struggle. So neither of us know the answer to that right now. But, um, yeah. but I think that for your argument to be effective, I, I think it has to rise to more than convenience. And I'm having a hard time struggling here to see why this isn't just the convenience for the prosecutor. We wanna bring this person at this time. They have this particular problem. 10 days from now, they're not gonna have that problem. And finish putting on your case and bring them in as a rebuttal witness. Seems to be kind of a straightforward thing. The trial judges deal with all the time. It's a constant problem for them and they always deal with it. Your Honor, in this case, that could actually prejudice the defendant. Page five mm -hmm. of the record shows that Agent Travis received her diagnosis only two days before she was scheduled to testify. And while the trial was already underway, the government had almost finished presenting its case against the defendant, as you rightly pointed out. However, Agent Travis was the crucial witness against the defendant. Well, you know, life is, I'm just saying life is full of risks for the prosecution that a, that a witness, crucial or not, uh, becomes unavailable or, or evidence gets to, you know, has to be not admissible. So what difference does it make the reason whether or not it was because of a pandemic diagnosis or other things which would change the situation? Isn't the real issue that unfortunately in that case, maybe the prosecution has a slightly less effective case. Um, so, you know, risk seems to me to be inherent in the concept of our criminal justice system certainly for the prosecution. The presumption of innocence, of course, is for the defendant. Your Honor, while risk is inherent in the criminal justice system, the Craig standard was designed to deal with situations like this, where remote testimony is necessary when an important public policy interest is met and the testimony is reliable. In this case, it would have been irresponsible to bring Agent Travis, who tested positive for COVID-19, into the courthouse, and a continuance also would have been inappropriate due to the risk that everyone, that anyone else involved in the trial might also contract COVID-19. Of course, and with the neighbor, of course, of course, in this situation, that's not to be harsh, but that's the people's problem. It's your burden, and if you can meet your burden then you can't meet your burden, that, that, then you suffer through that. And, and, and as a judge said just now, your case therefore becomes weaker, but we don't waive constitutional requirements because it's difficult for you to meet your burden if they're in place. You understand what yeah. I'm saying? Yes, are you referring to the burden of proof generally in a yes. criminal prosecution yes. or the burden? Yes, of, the, burden of, of the burden of proof generally. Yes, Your Honor, it certainly is the prosecution's burden of proof to put on a criminal case. However, Craig recognizes that in certain circumstances, witnesses whose testimony ought to be heard are not able to come to court due so to certain let's public say I have a kidney stone and I can't testify the day you want me to, but I know over, you know, three days later or four days later, I might be able to, but the judge has a trial scheduled in and doesn't want to do it, but it's a two day trial and it's a judge only trial. So he can do it a week later. What would be different from that and the public health crisis of COVID and just not bringing the witness in at all than just bringing the, the kidney stone person in say a week later. You see what I'm saying? Yes, and your honor. Convoluted Come analogy there anyway, but go ahead. <laughs> Address. Yes, with, with the kidney stone analysis, the court there would have to look at if, if there was a specific important public policy interest for but allowing you don't, that. You would, never think that the, you would never think that the Supreme Court of the United States would say, oh, you can take their testimony um, uh, by two-way video in that circumstance, would you? Precisely. And, and they wouldn't be able to do that, would they? They would not be able to. No, of and course. Because... So, so what, what raises this to a constitutional question is because of the public health crisis, right? No, Your Honor, Craig raises okay. this to a constitutional question. All right, because Craig ahead. does, yes, Your Honor, Craig does allow a court to admit remote testimony when that state has that important public policy interest. And there are indicia of reliability. And in this case, as the 13th Circuit held on page eight of the record, 
the need to protect people at the courthouse from the danger of contracting COVID from an individual so, who is- So, so we, we understand that argument, but isn't the real public policy at issue in Craig, the nature of the, of the witness, right? That the, the, the witness um, in that case is, the vic is a victim. While in this case, we're dealing with a law enforcement agent who probably there might be other avenues to bringing in similar testimony. Um, so, so doesn't it change the nature of the analysis and the policy depending on the nature of the unavail of the unavailability or the nature of yes, the your Yes, Your Honor, it certainly does because under Craig, each case has to make a case specific inquiry into whether or not there is an important public policy interest and that varies from situation to situation. For example, in the context of COVID-19, courts have recognized that general concerns about getting COVID-19 are not sufficient reasons to allow remote testimony. Whereas when an individual is known to have tested positive, that is a specific- So, so, what I'm, so you are agreeing then that if, if, agent, if the agent's testimony could be replicated by any other reasonable means, then in that case, um, uh, the, 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 um, she shouldn't be able to, to uh, testify via Zoom. Your Honor, de dependent on what exactly those reasonable means are, possibly it would depend on the specific facts of the scenario. But even if this court were to apply the harsher standard of Crawford and extend that to this case, Agent Travis's testimony was still properly admitted because she was unavailable due to COVID and her testimony was subject to live cross-examination. Her, her testimony was subject to live cross-examination unlike Crawford by the defendant, which therefore didn't deprive him of any meaningful opportunity to confront her. The main principle of Harmar of Crawford is that the defendant has a prior opportunity of cross-examination. When a witness is unavailable to testify in order to ensure that that testimony is reliable in the form of testing by the quote unquote crucible of cross-examination. And courts have recognized that video testimony with cross-examination generally preserves and enables the right of the defense to cross-examination. The majority of cases analyzed under Crawford are prior non-contemporaneous statements that were some, in some way subject to cross-examination in the past. So However, are, you, are, are you trying to say or imply that basically the idea that things need to be live, live is really just melodrama, right? That the functional effect is, is identical regardless of um, method of inquiry. Um, so are, 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 are we being overly dramatic about the value of live interaction? No, Your Honor, certainly not, as there are intangible elements to the courtroom that do occur live as courts have recognized. And while live testimony is preferable, video testimony can be allowed under Crawford, which is preferred to much other Crawford te testimony because unlike past testimony, I see my time has expired. May I briefly answer and conclude? Unlike past testimony, it allows defense counsel to have a full and fair opportunity for cross-examination. And because Agent Travis's testimony was admissible under either Crawford or Craig, we respectfully request that this court affirm the 13th Circuit's decision. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Merrill. Uh, there was a reservation of time for a rebuttal, I believe, but Mr. Gilbert, uh, is that you or is that Ms. Musselman who, or do you waive it? That's me, Mr. Mr. Chief Justice. Go ahead. Thank you. May it please the court. Uh, a couple quick points on rebuttal. Respondent noted, uh, argued that Craig uh, was tailored for these exact, exact type of cases. Nothing could be further from the truth. Craig was tailored specifically for the child sexual abuse cases. Nothing in the Craig opinion suggests that it should uh, be applied in these types of scenarios. And applying the public policy implications here means that there are endless exceptions that could be applied going forward. And every year, there's the, the flu is an issue in the United States from October through April. Does that mean witnesses who get the flu in trials through October through April can testify by two-way two live video? No. They're creating an exception here means that there are going to be more exceptions to the confrontation clause down the road. And that's not acceptable to the constitution. And, and, and that fundamentally uh, flies in the face of defendant Sixth Amendment rights. Second, on the issue of a continuance, 
uh, as the dissent noted on page 19 below, uh, the testimony by live video was for mere uh, convenience. Uh, respondent noted that a series of continuances might have occurred because of the nature of COVID-19. What does that say about holding trials during COVID-19, that all trials have to be virtual? No, there, if a juror had gotten COVID-19, then there would have been another juror. The fact is the prosecution had the chance to put on their case as they pleased. If Agent Travis couldn't meet the test in Crawford and the prosecution could get that testimony in a different way, through a different police officer who was at the scene or through other means. And the fact is they didn't. Um, and so, so the foregoing reasons, we respect for the request that this court reverse the 13th circuit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Sure, uh, <laughs> what we do next. Okay. <laughs> I want to Kanye appreciate, will, appreciate Kanye, the presentation. Kanye will put the competitors in a waiting room. Okay. The judges, you can fill out your score sheets okay. and submit them Okay. once he has them. He'll bring everybody back and you can give feedback, okay? Oh. All right.